Hi, everybody. This is lecture five in our series on the trivium. That is the first three of the classical liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Today, we are introducing logic. And again, we're focusing on logic as developed by the philosopher Aristotle in this series. Uh, let's get started. The title of the lecture is Aristotle Invent Logic which is an interesting thought that we'll get into. I mean, certainly people thought logically long before Aristotle um, and have subsequently in different ways even. But Aristotle is the first person to have really codified logic, to have made it into a formal discipline that one can study. We all use logic every day. You use logic when you're two years old. You lose, use logic when you're 102 years old, right? Um, we look at the world and we draw conclusions and we act based on those conclusions. This is called logica utens in Latin, logic as it is used. All of us are masters of this in our own way. However, it is also possible to study logic. And by studying it, by actually understanding why we draw the inferences that we do, uh, we can draw better inferences. We can be more logical. We can think more clearly and derive more truth from our observations and thinking. <clears throat> this is called logica docens. Docent is a person who teaches something. So at a museum, you might have a docent who takes you on a tour of the museum. Um, only in this latter sense did Aristotle invent logic. Obviously, he didn't invent logical thinking or, you know, the ability to make inferences from, from data, but he invented the formal study of logic. He tried to do it twice. And according to our author, Hauser, um, <clears throat> Uh, that author helpfully frames Aristotle's attempts in, in the following way. Aristotle started with the topics. Um, the work is called the topics. This is taken from the Greek word topos, meaning place. And uh, it refers to um, his effort to identify all of the best examples of logos, of rational appeal in various rhetorical artifacts, texts of his time, and to gather those best arguments under various themes, which he called topics. Now, in the case of logos used in the context of rhetoric, the result is something that is likely to be true, that's probably true, right? But not something that we can know with certainty to be true. Um, hence, it has a rhetorical function. It certainly engages the logical capacities of the hearers, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a true conclusion. Dissatisfied with that fact, Aristotle set about to develop a new tool, a new tool. His logica docens, his taught logic, um, was expressed in his book, The Organon. He realized, as it says on the slide here, that he needed a method to find a truth that is new, right? Not only to build uh, reasons or to identify reasons and build arguments about various uh, claims in a rhetorical context, but actually a future-oriented logic, not looking back at the past, but looking at the future, trying to develop predictive capacity to figure out what will happen in the future, what can we reliably know um, will occur. I mean, not many things maybe, right? But, but certain things we can based on what we do already know. <clears throat> this organon um, or tool that we can use, and that tool is logic itself, is known also as the logic of discovery, right? We become adept at an art, the art of thinking logically. Um, and this is, in this sense, differs. it differs from the sciences, right? Because an art is about some kind of well, we might say skill, that's technically distinct, right? Um, but it's an ability that we have to do something. Whereas the sciences are focused on truths not about ourselves or our capacities, but about the world around us, right? So, so logic <clears throat> as an art is inviting us to use this tool in such a way that we can discover new knowledge and knowledge that we can know with some certainty to be true. We have um, 
what I've already suggested here in a passage from our author, Hauser, once we ensure our reasoning, uh, that our reasoning is correct in structure and that our conclusions follow necessarily from our premises, we have taken the first step, Hauser writes, to achieving conclusions that are not just likely or probable, but conclusions that are true and necessarily so. We demonstrate the truth. Um, the, the, the word demonstrate means to show or to, to, to display something, right? Um, and Aristotle calls this, again, his new instrument, his new tool, the organon. Now, remarkably, um, to, to bring us a bit closer to the present, we may know about Francis Bacon, the individual credited with developing what we today learn as the scientific method, the method of experimentation and observing the world and deriving knowledge by means of induction, uh, which we will cover later in this course. Uh, one of the best known works by Francis Bacon is what he calls the New Organon, the New Organon. And this is the title page of that book over here, uh, Francis Bacon, the Novum Organum Scientiarum. Right? So, so what does this mean? The, the new tool or instrument of sciences. That new instrument was the scientific method. Right. So in titling his book this, <clears throat> Novum Organum Scientiarum, um, Bacon is saying he is doing the same thing Aristotle was doing, but he's, he's doing it in a new way. He's providing a new tool. Right. So previously we had thought, oh, well, the only way to know about the world is through kind of Aristotle's organon, to, using this tool of logic to derive new knowledge and discover new truths. And Francis Bacon is saying, well, no, that's not the only tool. Here's a new tool, right? And the, the question about whether this fully replaces the tool that Aristotle had developed or supplements it and, and provides um, abilities in other areas, I and mean, that's an interesting question. Um, I should just say, um, before going on here, uh, the, the, the title page here, the reason I put the picture up, you have a ship right? And it's sailing through these pillars out into the open sea. And so this was part of the, speak about it, rhetorical, right, uh, effort in the new sciences to show that the kind of adventure of discovery that the new natural sciences were inviting its practitioners to was exciting. It was bringing us out of this Mediterranean basin, right? It is taking us out into the open sea to discover entirely new things. Uh, so there's a very interesting history or, or, you know, issue here in the history of sciences that could be, um, that could be explored. But again, Francis Bacon developing a new version of Aristotle's organum, organon. But let's get back to Aristotle, <clears throat> because it'll be my claim to you that Aristotle's logic was not superseded um, uh, entirely by Francis Bacon's new uh, organon, new tool. Um, it was um, enriched immeasurably by Bacon's work, and I have nothing negative here to say about Francis Bacon's work, but in terms of our everyday lives and how we think about things and how we see the world, um, Aristotle's logic continues to present us with a compelling picture of the so-called logic of discovery, right? Okay, so I've decided I want to discover some things about the world, right? How am I going to do this? I, I want to know truth. I don't want to just watch TikTok and you know listen to what other people say and scroll on my newsfeed or whatever and, and, and repeat things I see there. I want to discover things for myself. Well, the first thing you have to do <clears throat> is to recognize your opinions. What are your opinions? Where are you starting from, right? These opinions, uh, we might call them beliefs, are translated out of the Greek word doxa, Doxa means an opinion, right? Not definite knowledge, but just things that we hold kind of uncritically at this stage to be true. Um, for Plato, who was Aristotle's teacher, doxa, this, these opinions that we have, were not the same thing as knowledge, right? We can, we can turn those opinions into knowledge. We, we can begin from those opinions, go through a process, and establish knowledge about the matters that those opinions concern, but we can't just say that what we happen to think about something without looking at it is in fact knowledge. So we are called then by, by not, <laughs> the teacher of um, Plato, so Socrates was the teacher of Plato, Plato was the teacher of Aristotle, uh, we are told by Socrates that an unexamined life is not worth living. A, a, a radical, a cri de coeur, right? A, a cry of the heart. The unexamined life is not worth living. It's not enough to go through life 
just repeating the opinions of others or, or you know, happening to believe something because we haven't really thought about it, right? The, the life that is worth living, the most, call it human life, is a life where we're always questioning, we're always examining, we're always investigating things to determine if, in fact, um, they are true. Um, <clears throat> so once we know what our opinions are and we've decided to set about this path of, of examination, right, of our, of our opinions, we need to begin to wonder about them. We need to begin to ask questions, right? So we'll look around the world and we'll wonder about it. Why is the world as it is? Uh, this beautiful line uh, from, um, from Aristotle that animals and God or gods don't wonder, Right? Animals don't uh, know things or can't know things in the same way that humans can. Of course, a lot that we could say about that and explore about that, but this is from Aristotle's point of view. And God is, of course, defined as having full knowledge about everything. So God uh, it doesn't have to ask any questions. Animals just don't ask questions in quite the same way that human beings do, and, and, and God doesn't need to. So we are uniquely, as human beings, called to to wonder about our opinions and about the world. As we begin to wonder, this takes the form of questioning. So we wanna formulate different kinds of questions. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm driven, I'm gonna examine my life, here we go, right? Well, what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna start by asking questions like, is the thing that I think is real, really real, right? It, is this the way it, it is? What actually is it, right? What is, we would say, the essence or the nature of something? What is What makes it what it is? Um, is it this or that? Uh, is it, uh, does it have this quality or that quality? You know, how does it relate to other kinds of things? And then finally, why is it so? What is the cause of X, of this thing that we're looking at? What is the reason why it is as it is? These are all questions that we can ask about things, and they form, famously, this uh, this shape. <laughs> I was going to say triangle. There are four triangles here, right? So it's, it, it's square. Um, what is it? Why is it? Whether it is this or that, right? What kind of qualities it has? And is it at all that it is, right? So these four questions for Aristotle uh, express in a kind of ideal form um, all the kinds of questions that we can ask about reality. So then finally, okay, we've identified our opinions, we've decided to examine our life, We've developed a little curiosity and we've started asking questions. That's great. What do we have to do next? We have to answer those questions, right? A question uh, we read is simply an answer turned inside out, right? So that's a kind of a nice way to put it. Um, if you're asking a question, you want to use reasoning to combine different facts that you know. We call those propositions, and we'll look at the logic of propositions later in this course, and to produce, based on those propositions, a conclusion. If these propositions are true, and if I have put them in the right order, then what can I know, right? Um, what can I conclude? What, what, can I, uh, what new knowledge can I derive beyond what's already contained in those propositions? Um, the conclusion that you get to when you, you know, link up those propositions, you put them in order, you make sure they're true, you come to a conclusion. That conclusion is, for you, something new. It is a new fact, something you didn't know before. Maybe you had an opinion about it, certainly, but you didn't have certain knowledge that that was the case. You didn't have an argument for it, right? Now, of course, in the philosophy of science, it's very interesting whether we really ever have certain, certain knowledge of anything, but there are certainly um, claims that are very well established Right? And then there are claims that are very poorly established. And we need to be able to distinguish between those two and make determinations about what we will actually hold to be true in any given case. <clears throat> okay, so that's our logic of discovery. You are invited, friends, to engage in this logic of discovery. Now, what Aristotle's going to do here is, as we put it, organize logic, and he's going to break it into what he calls the acts of mind. So, so how do we understand this process at a deeper level? Our, our image here includes uh, apples and heavy on one side, and then in the middle, heavy apples, right? And then outside of it, things that are not apples and not heavy. So he's, he's really giving us a whole picture 
of the world, right? When we, when we use words to refer to things, we're not doing so at random or, or just by kind of free association. We're trying to kind of map out what reality actually is. And we may never get there in full, um, but we can come closer and closer. That's, that's one of the kind of conceits um, or, or premises of this system. <clears throat> now, I've mentioned the three acts of mind, right? So, so we've described this kind of logical process of discovery, um, but let's apply this more directly to what we're going to be doing in the remainder of this course, which is to look at uh, terms, propositions, and arguments. One, two, three, right? Okay, so start, starting with this famous argument um, over here. <clears throat> Premise one, all men are mortal. And by that, uh, men means human beings, not just male human beings. Uh, premise two, Socrates is a man. Conclusion, therefore, Socrates is mortal. Right? So you have a first uh, proposition listed there. All men are mortal. That's a premise. You have a second proposition. Socrates is a man. These are claims that you're making about the world, right? That is also a proposition and serves as a premise. And then you have a conclusion. Socrates is mortal. So we have here three propositions, one, two, three. The first two of them are called premises because it's on the basis of those that we get the third, which is the conclusion. You can have an argument with as many premises as you can imagine, right? Uh, however many it takes to establish the conclusion, we're gonna be looking at arguments that contain um, usually two premises and a conclusion. Um, the conclusion is usually presented using the word therefore, because if you have the first two, and if you are following the laws of logic or the rules of logic that we're going to be learning, then you can know with some certainty that that last proposition is true. In this case, if Socrates is in fact a, a person, a man, right? And if in fact all persons, men, people die, then Socrates will die. Okay, so like you might say, well, I, I knew that, right? You had an opinion about that. You had a kind of doxa about that, but you didn't yet have the argument set out in a formal way. Um, and this is, of course, a very simple argument, but in more complex cases, you can reach more surprising conclusions. So let's see how this argument is built. So we know, okay, three propositions, including two premises and one conclusion. Um, to build the argument, you got to start with terms. Right? A term is basically a concept, a word or a set of words. And we formulate this in the mind and we try and capture the meaning of what we see in the world. So in this case, all men, taking men again to meet people, I look around the world, I experience lots of people, I form an idea of, okay, what is a person? Got it. Mortal. Mortal means you're going to die. Right. Okay. Maybe I have tragically experienced people I know, uh, the death of, of, of people close to myself. I've heard about the death of others. I'm aware that death is a thing, that one day I will die. I formed a concept of mortality, of death. Right. And the third one we need is Socrates. I've read some books about Socrates. You could put anybody's name in there. Right. Um, I have an idea about this person. So the terms here are men, mortal, and Socrates. Right. I need, I need to form those concepts, um, and then they're going to serve as terms in my reasoning, terms of the basic building blocks of logic. I'm, I'm able to look at the world, and I'm able to identify, okay, what what is it? Why is it? All those questions that we talked about with Aristotle, I'm able to kind of pick out things that then I reason about. Now, I've done my terms. I have my two little items laid out on the table here. I need to put those terms into relationships with each other. That is, I need to build propositions, right? Now, Hauser defines proposition as a mental judgment about the way things are in the world. A mental judgment. Um, we might state this in the form of a sentence, right? As in the first case here, all men are mortal. Now, we say make a judgment. I feel like to be judgmental today is something that many people are probably rightly uh, don't want to be. I don't, I don't want to be judgmental. You're not being judgmental here. I mean, to be judgmental is an excess, right? It means that you are forming judgments that, that are, you know, maybe more certain than they should be in more cases than are justified, right? That's to be judgmental. Um, but simply to make a judgment. I mean, if I'm crossing the street and I see a car coming, I make a judgment in that moment, am I going to make it across the street or not? I look at reality and I decide whether I'm going to make it. 
right? And I, that decision is my judgment. Uh, I can have good judgment. I can have poor judgment. We know how the word judgment typically is used. So in this case, I think about the world. I think about all the people I've ever known, all the people I've ever heard of, and I derive the, uh, I make the judgment, all people eventually will die. I've never heard of anyone who never died. Right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that to be true for the purpose of this argument. All men are mortal. Right? And then, same thing. I'm going to observe Socrates. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a judgment. Is Socrates, in fact, a human being? Okay, he is a human being. Right? So again, I'm making judgments about the world using the terms that I've identified. That's our second act of mind. And then our third and final act of mind, as, as we're putting it here, is to put those propositions together into an argument, right? This yields something. So I put together all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, and I come out with new information. Socrates is mortal, right? Again, pretty obvious example because we're just learning the format of it, but sometimes you can be surprised by the conclusions of this. Mathematicians all the time might come to a conclusion right, in some work that they're doing and think, my goodness, could this be possibly true? Think about Einstein, right? Really? Space and time operate like that? You know, really? Light behaves as both a particle and a wave? These are crazy things, but we're led to them through a reliable, logical, scientific process, right? Um, so that's how we get new information about the world. Um, even if we had some inarticulate sense before that Socrates were, was mortal or would one day die, now we know that. Okay, so first, second, third, right? First, you got to get your terms. Look at the world. Consider your experience. Formulate some concepts, right? And you might revise your understanding of those concepts. We do so every single day, right? But you have some picture of what the world is like, and you have words that you use to describe that world. Um, second act of mind, put those terms together to form judgments. Again, not being judgmental, but being careful to draw conclusions uh, stated in the form of a sentence, a proposition about how things are, and then put those things together into arguments, combine those propositions, and you're able to derive new knowledge. This is why it's a tool, why it's an instrument. Right? We're able to use this instrument to get something, to build something, in this case, certain knowledge about the world. Our last couple slides here <clears throat> are just going to introduce a, a, a distinction that's going to be kind of recurrent in, in the remainder of this series between analysis and synthesis. Right? So, I, okay, so I have my arguments and my, you know, I know my terms, propositions, I'm ready to go. I've got my organon all set, right? Well, what am I going to try and do? Am I going to try and start with a complex thing and break it down into parts? Because that would be to analyze something, right? If I, if I analyze a poem or if I analyze a movie, I'm taking a complete whole and I'm breaking it down. I'm saying, oh, look, this is how it works under the hood, right? I'm going to do a, a different, maybe I do different kinds of analyses of something, right? This is different from synthesis. And synthesis is when you take a whole bunch of different parts and you put them together to form a whole. So kind of like in the argument, when I start with men, mortal, and Socrates, I'm able to synthesize those, you know, by placing them into logical relationships to form the argument that I have. So analysis is taking things apart, synthesis is putting things together. And we can remember that with our handy dandy image here with analysis dividing one box here into three and, and the synthesis combining three into one. So keep that in mind, friends. That is all I have to say here to introduce Aristotle's introduction of logic. Next time we will dive into the logic of terms. Thank you all very much.